Fourth Watch, Pastor Dan Farrell and I are so glad you've tuned in today. My name is Tim Davidson. Pastor has a message for us today and it's called Operation Midwife. Take your Bibles please and turn to Exodus 1. Let's join the service already in progress. I'd like to introduce to you at this moment Bob and Vivian Scovegard. Could you give them a big hand please? Come on up. You go. Okay. Here you go, sister. All right. I don't need to. Tell, I don't need to tell you which one's Bob and Vivian. And uh, so, let me give you a, a few things because um, that way, when they talk, they can talk about something they want to talk about. All right. Bob and Vivian have got a ministry that they've adopted. Um, let's, let's scoot up so people can see. They've got a ministry that the Lord's given them of going to the Dayton. Um, abortion mill where doctors uh, Haskell and they protest by way of placards but also their presence uh, speaking to the nurses, the doctors, the, the, the young ladies or young men that come into that place. Uh, Bob didn't do it for 25 years because of working but this young lady here has done it for 25 years Monday through Friday from the time it opens to the time it closes. Andrew Tooney said there was days he went up there where it was frigid cold and snowing and he's chilling thinking I want to get out of this weather and she's still there. Now we're talking about from you guys have been deer hunting you know what it's like to sit from nine o'clock till four o'clock. She said that one of the abortion clinics is only open th from Tuesday to Friday, but there's other abortion clinics. For 25 years, she's been going to a um, abortion clinic Monday through Friday. Now, I know you're against abortion, but you're not against abortion like they've exhibited. Second, she came from an Episcopalian church. The first 10 years she did this, starting in 1989, she was lost. She did not trust the Lord Jesus Christ as her personal Lord and Savior. And then the Lord made you a Baptist, right? <laughs> I like to get that in, you know? I don't know. I just like getting those things in. Um, yeah, that's right. He made you a follower of Christ, which is a Baptist. Um, <laughs> 10 years later... Ten years later, then the Lord saved this Danish sinner. Skovgard is Danish, he told me, and saved him. So while he was working, she was doing it, and Bob does. He credits his dear wife for being more zealous than him and did it longer than he. But, but, but he also has stood by her and has done this now probably, I'm guessing, what, 15 years or more, Correct. All right, now let's talk. Uh, Bob, give us a, a fill in the gaps that I did not uh, share what the Lord has been doing in your lives. And then I remember some things, and I'll get you back on point, because there's some things that you may not bring up, but I will. Okay, go ahead. Right. Yeah, the main thing is what don't people get about the dismembering of babies? We're made in God's image. That's underlying uh, Western civilization all these centuries that we treat each other well because of that. And now we have little babies made in God's image and they're being slaughtered 35 a week on average at that one abortion mill four or five blocks from where we're at. And it, it just astounds us uh, that, that it can continue. We just can't, can't express it. And when Vivian first got started, uh, go ahead and tell them your experience? Well, um, when I first got started, at that time we had three meals, and so that's why I was going five days a week. But um, 
when I, what I did, this is to show you how the church does nothing and why the abortion mills are open because of the church. Same-sex marriage out there because of the church. They sit in the pews and they won't go out to where the church should be. And I remember one time we were, I was with a group, Operation Save America, I'm still with them, and we were in Indianapolis doing, trying to bring the abortion issue to the people in the streets. And one guy comes up, I was not a Christian then, but he comes up to me and said, you should be in church, you don't, shouldn't be out here. And so I said, you don't understand, the church is here, it's in the streets. And so me not even being a Christian understood what it meant, you know, for the civil rights movements, it was because of the church got involved in that in 1964 that came about bringing the injustices there. So I understood, but one of the things I did, I said, Bob, I'm going to write to 10 different pastors. This is priests and pastors. And I'm going to just say, won't you please do something? So I started out saying, I am not a Christian, but I know that you have power in Jesus Christ. Wow. And I know that if you come out and stand for this, stand against abortion, that it could be a change because it was in our past history, slavery and during the civil rights movement. Well, I smelled it out. I got one letter back and the pastor said, well, this reverend, whatever he was, he said, I know you're not a Christian because you address me as reverend. I am an elder. So Bob and I start looking at the Bible. What's the elder? Okay, what's the good? We didn't quite understand all the difference. And so, but he did say that he appreciated the brochure I sent him and that the help I gave him about where women could get help if they were thinking about having an abortion. We have these wonderful women's centers, as you all guys know, all throughout the area. And, <clears throat> and he said he would speak on abortion. But the whole, but the sad part about it, guys, the sad part was not one of them said, I'm concerned about your soul. Not one of them. And so, but you know what? It didn't surprise me. It didn't surprise me. Because when we were blocking the doors to the abortion mills to stop moms from going in to kill their babies, you know, we got criticized from, quote, the church. You got criticized from them. You're not, you're not Christ-like. You're not acting Christ-like. Christ wouldn't do that. He'd come across loving. Well, the most loving thing we were doing was stopping moms from going in to kill their babies. You know? So, and so, but, so I see all this. I want to tell you, we were at the abortion mill one day. Guy pulls in with his daughter. I start telling him about, <clears throat> you know, this help across the street, blah, 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 and that, and Christ has given this precious gift of life to nurture and birth, not to throw away and so forth. Let's celebrate this life. He turns and he says to me, I don't hear anything from you. You know, um, Christ says that you're not the judge, you're not the judge, you're not the judge. I said, well, show me that, where they say that. So he says, um, and he says, I don't hear anything from you. So he goes in. He comes out later. He starts saying, you can't tell me anything. I'm a pastor. I'm paraphrasing. And I said, you're a pastor. I said, boy, the devil's really got a hold on you. You know what he said to me? The devil doesn't have a hold on me. I'm full of the Holy Spirit. He's there with his daughter to have his daughter have an abortion. And this is what you see, folks, at the abortion mill. You know, the lady drives in in the back of her car. Jesus <laughs> Christ died for all of us to save our sins. She's bringing somebody there to have an abortion. And I'm looking at this and I'm saying to her, how can you drive in here with that, light, mm -hmm. that thing, a bumper sticker on your car? And she, she says, well, I, she, she brings her, I said, what? So I said, just say, you know, you're not shining the light on that you're supposed to shine. You, can, you say you're a Christian, where's the light? She says, I shine the light on, I said, no you don't. I said, what if I'm an atheist out here who knows that you're not supposed to kill babies? Because right. I know an atheist who stood up for life. And she says, I said, what are you going to tell that atheist? What are you going to tell him? He knows that you're not supposed to slaughter babies. And here God's giving you a gift of life to nurture and birth. And you're in there going into that death chamber to throw it away. 
And she doesn't know what to say. She says, oh, I don't understand it either. I said, well, I understand it. You lost. You lost your soul. You're here bringing someone here to kill their baby. You know, so we get this. A pastor drives in with his daughter telling me she's there for a pregnancy test. It doesn't take two hours to get a pregnancy test. And then he tells me, I show him the boarded image, and he says, you're not Christ-like. And I said, oh, but you are. You're sitting in your car having your daughter and you're having an abortion. I'm standing out here giving you the truth. Christ wants you to see the truth. This baby wants you to know this is what they're going to do to me. And he didn't know what to say. On but the you, positive but, side, there's a story about this Oh, I'm sorry. I get side. <laughs> Tell me. Okay, I do have some wonderful, because we do, you know, big moms do change their minds. And I have so I'll many stories that we can tell about this. And, <clears throat> and it's so wonderful to see God's hand. And sometimes you see it so clearly. You know, you say, wow. You know, things just happen. And only, you only know it could be God. Amen. You only know it could be God. But I do have to tell you this here. There's this big guy I know. He's a big brute. He's tall, you know, you look like when you meet him on the street, oh boy, I better stay away from him. He's a, he's a teddy bear, he's holding his sign, his name is Doug, and he's holding his sign. So this lady comes in and, you know, we start talking to her, telling her she can get help and so forth. And she comes out maybe about, oh, an hour later or so, and she said, I changed my mind. So I said, great, what was it? She said, that sign, mm -hmm. that sign. And I only tell you that because you never know, you never know what would touch a mother's heart. Amen. You, know, you never know. I, you know, someone could be there praying by themselves. Like one of my friends, she was off at a distance praying. And this lady comes out, from, she's from Indiana. It was a two-day procedure, I mean, a bigger baby. And she goes over to him and she said, will you pray for me? So Jolene said, of course I will. And she started praying for her. She was thinking about having an abortion because she had taken drugs and she figured the baby would be addicted. And what life would that baby have and so forth. So she was deciding to have an abortion. And JoLynn got her to go down to one of our centers and she drove back to Indiana and she sent JoLynn a picture of her baby boy. So, you know, I, there's so many Amen. stories. And it's, what I want to say to one thing, I don't know how much time I have, Pastor. You, you're taking all the oh, time you so, need. Well, I'm going to say you got to run for vice president <laughs> no, of America. Amen. No. <laughs> well, one other time, and, well, this one story I'll tell you. You know, people think guys are always forcing the moms to go and have the abortion. Most times it's not like that. Yes, there are some guys who just want and try to convince her and threaten her and all this. Most of them were there just kind of, well, it's her choice. If she does it, you know, I'll be there for her. If she doesn't, I'm there for her. But you do see some of them coming there trying their best to stop. And when they come out of that building and you see their look on their face and you're, they're just broken because they weren't able to stop the mother from killing their child. But one time was at one abortion mill, and that closed in um, 1997, but it's down there. And this guy comes in, his name is Brad, he came from Cincinnati. The mother, his, his girlfriend, and his girlfriend's mom was with them. And the girlfriend's mom wanted her to have the abortion. And Brad wasn't sure. So I got to talking to Brad, and the death escort, um, that's the, uh, quote, one of the clinic workers, she came out and she said, um, she started to get him to go in. And I wrote my telephone number quick on Brad, I gave him a piece of paper. I said, Brad, keep that and call us. And so at that time, I didn't have a cell phone, so it was our home number I gave him. And so I was at the, I had gone, I left that mill and I went to the other mill. And, and so when I got home, Bob calls and he said, Brad calls. He called me from inside the abortion mill. And he says, I'm in here now, what do I do? So Bob talked to him and you know, told him, well, get her out of there, get her out of there. So Brad said, well, tell Vivian to call me tonight. And he says, um, and she'll know what we did. So I called him and he said, I just want to tell you, 
I got her home. I got her out of there. See, he fought for his child. He did. Her mom was not pleased, but his mother was very pleased. So I told Brad, you know, you're a hero. You won't have to live because we do have guys who do live with the sorrow that they did not speak up, did not fight for their baby. But um, so he has one that he can celebrate. And so, you know, Amen. so we fear for that. And then one time, this guy, he brings this girl. And so now remember, I always tell him, I tell the guys mostly, I say, you go in there, you get that baby and that mom out of there. You always have to tell them there's two people that's going in that building, the baby and the mother, you know, and get them out of there. So I was talking to this one guy, and he's saying, well, I don't want her to have it. And he's walking back, well, I don't know what to do, man. She's going to, you know how it is, women get to talk, and they won't listen, blah, blah, blah. I said, you go in there. She wants you to take control. Deep down, she really does. Go in there and talk to her. So he goes in. He comes back out and he says, she won't listen. She won't listen. Well, I kept on go back in there. And he did. And the fourth time he came back smiling, thumbs up, and she came behind him. And so they had their precious baby. Amen. So sometimes you got to be forceful. You really do. Just a few months ago, this guy come up from Cincinnati. And he had parked across the street from the abortion mill. So... Now, some of you have been up there, so you know, of course, the street, we have a woman's center. That's the good guys, right? And so <clears throat> he's parked over there, but then his, the girl, the woman was in the car with him. So he walks over, and he um, comes to me. I said, what's going on? He said, that's why I come over to you for. And he says he was a Christian, and he really didn't want her to have the abortion. So we talked, and there was a young man named Jim. Jim, he was there, Jim Brooks. He's been in this for a long time. So I called Jim. I said, Jim, let's pray with him. So we did. And <clears throat> so this girlfriend sitting over there across the street was mad, and she started honking on the horn. Well, he ignored her. And then so finally she started to drive the car out, and she honked on the horn. She stopped. I said to him, I said, is that your car? He says, yeah. I said, you know what you do? You get in that car. And you just get in and you drive out of here. Don't you even come across the street. You just drive on back to Cincinnati. And he hesitated. I said, get in the car. You go get your car. You go in there. You're the man. I said, now she's going to scream at you, punch you, beat you up, cuss at you. But you get in there and you drive on back Amen. home. So he, he gets in the car. And he, I said, don't you come back here. Because I said, I'm like your mom. I'll beat you. And so he jumps in the car. He jumps in the car and he takes off and he left. So sometimes you guys, you know, sometimes we, we females, we women, we sometimes say, well, I'm going to do what I'm going to do. And we all the time we want you to really say, no, this is what we're going to do. You know, and sometimes that's what we need to do. You can't just... Go, well, she's going to, you know, she's just going to talk, 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 and I'll never give up. So, okay, okay, I'll do what she wants to do. But there's so many stories. The one story I want to tell you, how do you get, well, there's two. Well, there's so many, but these two I'll pick out. This, um, I get a call from this lady from Indiana, Indianapolis, Indiana. She says, Vivian, there's a young mom who's here from Dayton. So that means, when she says that, that means that she's in Indiana to do the chemical abortion because Haskell does not do chemical abortions. At least he didn't at that time here in Ohio. So she said, yeah, and she has an 18-hour waiting period in Indiana. That means the first day she can talk to the abortionists. I don't call them doctors. I call them abortionists. She can talk to the abortionists and then she has to wait 18 hours before they do anything to the baby. So she came back to Dayton. So my friend from Indiana said, I gave her your telephone number. Is that okay? I said, yeah, that's great. So, and I told her that, she, that I'm going to give Vivian your telephone number and she will call you. So I did call her that night. Now she lives in Dayton and she had gone to Indiana. And so I called her that night. I talked with her, so forth. Then about... Later that week, this woman drives up near the abortion mill, 
she went into the parking lot, and then she turned around, and I told her, I said, you know, if you need help, you can go across the street to the women's center, and they'll give you a free ultrasound and so forth. So she did. She went over, and then she came back out well, about an hour or so later, and she stops, and she says to me, um, do you have any pictures of abortions? So I said, well, yeah. So I gave her the information. She looks at it, and she gets kind of teary-eyed. I said, how far are you in the pregnancy? She said, oh, I'm about eight, nine, no, 11 weeks, about 11 weeks. And so I said, oh, I said, wait a minute, wait here. So I ran and I got, you guys might have seen it. You have the little feet, it's about 10 weeks in the pregnancy. So I ran and I got the little feet and I had one of those little baby models that's about 11 weeks and I got that for her and gave it to her. And she said, oh, and she put the little feet on and she started crying a little bit. And so I said, well, I said, I'm Miss Vivian. So, cause I, you know, I tell the young people I'm Miss Vivian. So she says, she stopped. I said, why is your mom named Vivian? She says, no. She said, you talked to me. I was the one that was in Indiana. And you talked to me that time on the phone. And so I decided I was gonna go to the abortion. But then I saw you today and I didn't know who you were, but you sent me across the street. And so I went over there. And then she said, and then I stopped to talk to you. I don't know why. I said, that's all God. That's all God. That's all God. Amen. You know? And then, so one day, um, this girl came into the abortion mill, and I talked to her, blah, blah, blah. And she goes in. She comes back out. And she's a little chilly, and she's looking for a ride, or a ride had gone. So I talked with her. I said, why don't we go across the street to the Savills and have some hot tea or coffee or something. So she did go over with me. She was from Middletown. Now, I carry a lot of literature with me, and I didn't have, I usually don't have the one from Middletown on me. I usually do not have that on me. And we're over there. So we're talking, and she had put her ID card on the table, so I saw her name, and she was from Middletown. I said, you're from Middletown. I said, oh, I said, wait a minute. I'm gonna run across the street and get and I reached in my pocket, and there was the brochure for Middletown. So I give her that. It's a woman's center in Middletown. So we're talking and talking. And so I said to her, I said, now, um, I said, now, are you considering abortion, really and truly? And she said, yeah. And she said she didn't have much help from her family. But she said the guy was supportive of her. He wouldn't, you know, he would be supportive of her and everything. And so she said, um, so I said, well, can, we, can I pray with you? She said, yes. So we prayed, and then after it was over, this gentleman comes up. He was like two tables from us, and he comes over, and he says, um, excuse me, ladies. He said, but, you know, God led me over here to pray for you, and he pointed to her. And he said, there's some, something in your life that's really changing here, and God just tells me that, is profound and that um, really think about what you're doing. And the thing, you know, because when I prayed with her, I said, God, please put people in her path, godly people in her path, to show that you Amen. are there to help her. And so in here, he stands there. And she looks at me, and I look at her, and she just smiles, you know. Amen. And he says, well, I have to go. And he left. And so later on, we're sitting there talking. And the guys at the Salva, one of the owners, he comes over. Now, he didn't hear any of this. He was in another room. But he comes over with a cookie, one cookie. And he says, I just want to give you this cookie. And he gives her this cookie. Not me. He gives it to her. So I said, see? I said, that man spoke to you. We pray that God would put people in your path. And I said, and here was another kind, godly man who comes over and shares cooking with you. And I said, and the brochure from Middletown that I usually don't have with me, there it was for you. God's and walking. I said, God's talking to you, hon. God's talking to you. Don't turn your back on that. Now, I, I, I've never seen her come back, you know, to have That's the good. abortion. I don't know. All right, baby, but, you here, know, man. God is constantly working if people yeah. just listen. But it's the church is the church has got to get up and listen and do what God commands them to do. Well, here's what I want to ask. Um, Bob was trying to figure out 
So in the course of 25, 26 years, thank you, and it's hard to keep count, but it looks like God has used you and Sister Vivian to save how many babies? I would say conservatively uh, on her part, uh, around 700. And she's been at it 25 years. And this is a conservative. This is just not people who come to the mill and say, I've, I've decided not to do it. This is someone she's interacted with and someone she's praised. He told me in the baptistry room, he said seven to 900. And so, um, I hope there's some kids out there called Bob and Vivian. Um, <laughs> Let me ask you, now, now, do you tell me, go ahead, pick your microphone back up. Let me find out. So there are several churches, we'll not single them out, that are around that abortion mill. Oh, yeah. And you've approached churches about coming out and helping yes. and pastors. And did one of the pastors say, that's not our ministry? Or something to that effect? One, two, I don't remember that one. They will all say that uh, they're busy with other, other programs. Things. And, right. And other ministries. Okay. But they've, they've never di indirectly, indirectly said, said that. Okay. Yeah. And right. so you wrote letters to priests and pastors mm -hmm. and admitted that you were lost yourself. Right. And right. not one of those pastors wrote back and said, we would like to help you. No, no. not one. Not so one. Vivian told me, she said that the issue today with America then is people are playing church in a the pew. They're not out there. And we think that we're doing God's work like right now. And I've always preached this to you, that when you come to someone's supper table and they feed you, you're not serving God. You're not serving God till on that meal you go out there and do something. And by the way, I wonder, Bob and Vivian, not to congratulate Morning Star Baptist Church, how many of you, if that abortion clinic, that abortion murder mill was down the street, I wonder how many of us would be down there. And yet we're against abortion. Right. Just like the Germans were against killing Jews mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that lived next to Treblinka mm -hmm. and Drakow and Auschwitz. They're against it. Right. You have a grandma? Go kid her. We've got to, the Christians in America, and listen, the first 10 years, she was lost. God saved her later. And she was out there every day as a lost Episcopalian. And yet we got a bunch of born again Baptists. Oh man, you're there watching Monday Night Football. You know, we do, you know, in football, they say there comes a time in fourth quarter, you got to do a gut check. We need to do a gut check and find out what it is we're all about. But here you're seeing a, a dear man and his wife not to try to, in any way, put you on a pedestal. But for 25, 26 years now, every day, Monday through Friday, they're there trying to rescue babies. And the Lord has done it, but seven to 900 babies are now... I mean, it's possible that there's a kid walking around that's 24 years old. You know how many babies I think I've rescued? Maybe one. Praise God. But praise God for that baby. Mm -hmm. And she brought that baby back a year later. Praise I was God. preaching. Wow. And we had that baby on TV of a precious baby that was saved because she stopped to hear me preach. Right. And uh, so, ladies and gentlemen... This abortion, and, and we, with tears, we were discussing this. Why can we not stop this in America? I'm sick and tired of politicians running on pro-life and not do anything about it. I'm sick of it. You understand? I'm sick of it. I'm sick of the homosexuals having the loudest mouth. I am. I'm tired of it. And I beg you to speak up. Because, I don't know, do they look ultra talented do they look ultra rich they just got involved they just got involved just did something so this one verse 15 and the king of egypt spake to the hebrew midwives of which the name of the one was shifra and the name of the other puha and he said 
When you do the office of a midwife to the Hebrew women and see them upon the stools, if it be a son, then thou shalt kill him. But if it be a daughter, then ye shall, then she shall live. But the midwives feared God and did not as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the men children alive. And the king of Egypt called for the midwives and said unto them, Why have ye done this thing and have saved the men children alive? And the midwives said unto the Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not as the Egyptian women, for they are lively and are delivered ere the midwives come in unto them. Therefore God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and waxed very mighty. And it came to pass, because the midwives feared God, that he made them houses. So I hope this will help your house, will you? There's $1,100. I want to say thank you. This is from Morning Star Baptist Church. I love you. And Pharaoh charged all his people, saying, Every son that is born ye shall cast into the river, and every daughter ye shall save alive. Title, title of the message, Operation Midwife. Be seated. Now, you know, history runs in cycles. It seems like, you know, we have different periods of time, but really it's the same villains. Um, it, it, it's the same... Um, victims, the same heroes, and yet things do change. I think it's kind of like cycles. We keep getting lower and lower and lower. So I'm going to bring you three thoughts, three thoughts, and I'll be done. A Hebrew crisis, and then we look at chapter 1 of Exodus, a Hebrew, our human crisis, and then we'll close with a heart crisis. Now there was a day in the arid land of Ham, Mizraim, that the state became more important than the individual. Ambition got ahead of morals. Expediency was more than truth. There was a young lady just a few weeks ago on the computer that was bragging about having an abortion and said she's got her youthful figure back and took a picture of how thin she was. Her figure was more important than life. But what she doesn't understand, she lost more than just a baby. She may have lost her soul. Right. That's right. You've lost your conscience. And let me tell you, what, what we have today in America is we have a, a citizenry, 330 million, that do not care about the precious lives of babies. That says something about us. That we don't care. Listen, there's a lot of sin we're guilty of. Me especially, but let me say this. Don't kill babies. Amen. Abraham is here. And him and his dear wife are expecting the baby. He said they know of a situation where, let's see, three women showed up to not celebrate, but to facilitate the killing of a baby. The mother brought her daughter. But along with the mother was the grandmother. And along with the grandmother was the great-grandmother. They came to kill a baby. Has the thought occurred to these stupid women that, listen, your mother didn't do it. They interrupted, like Vivian said, a generation. Two lesbians sported all over the Internet. They had a banner. If Mary would have had an abortion, we wouldn't have to put up with this Christian thing today. Listen, let me tell you, this is more, this is more than just women's rights. It's much more than that. And it's Jacob Yates, I don't see him in now. He's probably in Children's Chapel. There is now a woman that owns three or four abortion clinics, and she's growing. She is a professed witch. She has said publicly on the Internet that when they kill babies, she's sacrificing them to Satan. That's what's going on in America. But what we have today, listen, that's not as atrocious as Christians that are mute. Christians that are more concerned about their stupid pizza than they are what's going on in America. I got a letter today, this, or weeks ago, she said, what you know and you preach it, it is so rich to us, but I can tell it makes you really unhappy. It's one of the most astute things I ever heard. And she says, I want to thank you for being willing to be unhappy and carry the burdens that you do. Amen. I thought she captured it, man. She said it better than I do. 
Ladies and gentlemen, these midwives got involved. And the ECLU was mad at them. You say the ECLU, the Egyptian Civil Liberties Union. <laughs> Godless reprobates that they are. Got mad at these midwives and said, what are you doing? And of course, they tried to spin it. But the bottom line is they feared God. It tells you that. And that's why we gave you the Shifra and the Puha Award. They got involved. They couldn't save all the babies, but they could save some. They couldn't fix the whole problem, but they could fix this problem. You see? And imagine, I can't, I just, I've never met anybody that was used of God to save 700 lives. 700 plus lives. Now I know, be humble about that's fine. That's fine. But you realize, to me, where's Mr. Obama? Why isn't he decorating them? Why are they not being invited to the White House? That's why I want this on TV. There's the hero and the heroine. That's coming out of my mouth. That's what I say. I bow to them. And we need, and here's what's sad. We could have more Bob and Vivians. We could have more people that could do what they do because all they do is stand there and hold a placard and then God has educated them and look what they've done. Oh my goodness, folks. We are going to have to stand before future generations and answer why did we do little. I've been out there to many abortion clinics and I've seen Roman Catholics standing out there protesting abortion. And meanwhile, Baptists want to stand back. They're self-righteous, smug, and criticize Catholics for this, this, and this. But at least they're out there trying to save babies' lives. You say, well, I can't believe you're saying that. Well, man, then get it on recording. I don't cut Baptists any slack. At least on that issue, I give Catholics heads up. There's a Catholic church on Hamilton Mason Road. They put crosses all over their front yard to draw attention to the fact that we're killing babies. Why can't we do that? Where are the Protestants and the Baptist preachers that'll stand up and thunder out against the sin? What are we afraid of? I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen. And by the way, I've been told that Westchester TV has been cutting me off when I get hot and bothered under the collar. Well, then you better get ready to go ahead and cut me off again right now. I'm sick of it. I believe that God hates it. You know why God doesn't get more involved? Can I tell you why? I'm going to tell you why. Because God's standing back, and he's wanting to see how much of this we're going to take. Now, I'll tell you what, when God gets involved, when God gets involved, here's what he does. He wipes things out, man. The days of Noah, the godly line did not stop the ungodly line. So God says, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to send a little rain. I'll take care of this. Lot, he was vexed with the, 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 uh, the filthy communication of the wicked. His righteous soul was vexed. But Lot and his family didn't do anything to stop Sodom and Gomorrah. So you know what God said? I'll stop this. I'll stop it. Rome was killing babies. Rome was even waiting until after they were born and killing babies. Rome was atrocious. The filthiness, the debauchery going on in Rome. God says, I'll take care of Rome. And God will take care of America too, buddy. God will take care of this country. And it will be partly our fault. You hear me? Don't you blame this on... Um, Saturday Night Live crowd. Don't blame this on the homosexual crowd. It's our fault. And I'm telling you, I hope, I, listen, I, I am so, I'm telling you right now, I am so stinking ashamed of preachers and myself, and I'm ashamed to be a preacher. I never thought I'd hear that said. I'm sick of it. I am so fed up with pastors, a bunch of paid CEO, pampered, lazy, stinking pinheads. That all they care about is trying to build up their little private ministry. Amen. It's true. It makes me sick. They'll draw a check and a salary. They won't wear out any shoe leather for Christ out there. Amen. They would never go to an abortion clinic. Why? Because that doesn't look real professional. Amen. I'm ashamed of us. I am ashamed. And so these two midwives got involved. But it wasn't just a Hebrew crisis. It's a human crisis today. I've got so much material. I'll say this. this. This report just came in. Induced abortions, the number one cause of death in the United States. Right here it is. Got all the stats. It's amazing to me of how atrocious this is. Just in 10 years, 
AIDS has killed 43,000, motor vehicle accidents 41,000, suicide 31,000, homicide 26,000, liver disease 25,000, kidney disease 23,000. Induced abortions, this is just in a 10 year span, 1,359,000. It, it, it wipes them out. It's more than cancer, it's more than accidents with other vehicles, pneumonia, influenza, diabetes. It's more than cancer of all types. Abortion. It's the number one killer in America. Since 81, deaths by AIDS, 500,000. Since 81, deaths by abortion, 38 million. Since 2009, AIDS, 15,000. Death by abortions on demand, then uh, under reports, 1,000, let's say 1,800,000, more probable. Abortions worldwide then, uh, to the date of this, was 46 billion. Now it's approaching 60 million. And yet we'll have Hollywood get up their hands across the world protesting AIDS. Who, who's going to lift up their voice for the silencing of the unborn? You young people, you listen well to me. You better make sure now you're against abortion right now. And then lastly, I promise you I'd get out of here, a heart crisis. Thomas Jefferson said this, to the care of human life and happiness and not their destruction is the first and only object of good government. And so here's what I have to say to you. Our government's not good. It's not a good government. I, uh, I love America. I hate our government. You hear me? Did I stutter? We don't have a good government. It's not good. And that goes for Republicans, Democrats, I don't care. It's not good. Shifra and Puha got involved. That's called civil disobedience. Civil disobedience. Why? Well, it was against the law to do what they did. They went against the law. But they obeyed moral law. God's law, the Supreme Court, the real Supreme Court, that's in heaven. Amen. That's the real Supreme Court. Amen. That's what's going to take care of America. And so I know I'm, 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 I'm just a peon. I'm nothing. Very few people listen to me. I'm telling you, America's in serious trouble. You young people, look at me. You know, I've, I've interviewed a lot of teenagers. I have never seen a group of teenagers like I have seen in the last two years. They have no hope. I've asked them. When I was 18, 19, I couldn't wait to embark in the big world. I couldn't wait to get out there. Not today. Teenagers, most of them don't even want to graduate from high school. Because they don't see a future. America's in trouble. And if you don't ask God to help you to get involved, then there's something wrong with you. There is, there's something wrong. Let's close with this verse. I'm going to be true to my word. I'm going to go less than 19 minutes. Turn to the book of 1 Timothy, chapter 2. See, what you could do is pray. What you could do is write letters. You could vote correctly. Stop voting your wallet and vote principle. And you could help save babies' lives. Go to an abortion clinic, protest. You could. You know what you could do? You could join a right to life group. In a pro-life group. You could do that. But please look, if you will, at 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. And I'm not going to get into all the doctrinal implications, but I do want you to see something maybe you've never seen. Notwithstanding, talking about women, she shall be saved in childbearing. Didn't say child killing. Now watch this. If they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. Let me ask you a question. When it comes to abortion, does it take faith? No faith. How about charity? Is there any love there? Not true love. Holiness. There's no holiness. And how about sobriety? Why no, man. There's no way. Here's what Mordecai said to his dear niece, Esther. For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But then and thy father's house, but thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? So I'd like to say this. 
I'd like to challenge every one of you to not only get involved in fighting abortion and fighting the, the, the crimes of our society, but also get involved in furthering the kingdom of God. How do you not know that God's going to use you? I beg you. In fact, I'll tell you what we used to do as a kid. I'll just say this. I double dare you. I double dare you to get involved. Jayla's been talking about starting a pro-life um, group in our church. Why don't you start? Amen. Let's get busy. Um, you know, again, I hate to keep saying it because I never was a great football player, you know. I loved it. I love I loved eating quarterbacks. I just love it. But I never was a great quarterback. But you know what I, you know what I did? There were a few games when Lakota and Baptist Bible College, when we would be up at fourth quarter. And, um, you know, it might be like, say, it's, it's 31 to 6 or 31 to 10, and there's only five minutes left in the fourth quarter. Now, I always play defense. Now, I don't know if you guys understand this. Defense is, um, do you ever play defense? Okay. Do you take it as a moral victory that we don't want them to score? I don't care that we're going to win the game. We're going to win the game. Well, good. I'm glad we're going to win the game. But they're on the five-yard line, and there's three minutes left. I don't want them to score. So we would dig in. It was a moral thing, man. We cannot let them score. You say, but if they score, you're still going to win. I don't care. I don't want them to score. We did everything we could to keep them from scoring. My point is this. Are we going to win... Is Jesus Christ going to win? Yes. yes. Are we more than conquerors through him that loved us? Yep. Yep, so we're going to win. No. Is Satan a loser? Yes. Satan's a stinking loser. You follow the devil, you're a loser. That's just the way it is. All right, so we win. I still don't want him to score. I don't want him to score. I feel like right now in America, we're like on our five-yard line, and we're in, a, we're in a stop defense goal line stance right now. Now, what are we going to do? I'm not going to tell you who I met last week, because you, you don't have the guts for it. But I met a special guy last week, man. You talk about trying to stop abortion, this guy did. And he went to jail for it. I said, I've always heard about guys like you, but I've never met one. I said, I respect you. But he spent six years in jail. But boy, this guy, man, he's the real dude. We've got soldiers out there, and I'm not asking you to do what he did. But it's time you get involved. It's time that morning stars step up. It's time. I, I don't care if our attendance goes down to 50. Give me 50 soldiers. We need some soldiers. We need some men and women. And not just about the abortion issue, soul winning. Because, look, I mean, how hypocritical is it we're trying to save babies' lives, but the precious babies that are alive, we're not going to invest in them. Well, that's dumb. If we've got precious kids like these 10 kids that were lined up here, I think there were 11, these precious 11 kids, well, let's love them too. Let's help them. But all the way around, let's step up. Could you hear what Vivian said? She wrote, 10 pastors and priests and said, I'm not even a Christian, but would you get involved? Not one. And not one witness to her about Christ. What was your opinion of Christians then? My opinion of true Christians. It's good. But of that, what did you think of that? Well, like I told you, it surprised me. It's what I expected. She said, as a lost person, she goes, that's pretty much what I expected. Shocking. Shocking. God bless America. We're just like Rome. We think, God, you know, the greatness of Rome. And we think God does not need us. And it's up to us in a way. I know this sounds kind of melodramatic. It's really kind of up to us to save America, really. Because this is the real America. Who do you think George Washington and James Madison would hang out with if they were here today? It wouldn't be that crowd. What do you say? Maybe you're like Vivian. You're not even saved. You're against abortion. Boy, you're against abortion. And you agree with that. And you're conservative. You're a Catholic. You're a Baptist, whatever. But you're not even saved. You, man, you're going to abort your soul when you die and go to hell. Don't go to hell. Christ died so you wouldn't be aborted. Why don't you trust Christ? 
And then you, you, you think you've got zeal now. You think you're upset now about what's going on in America. Wait until the Lord saves you. Your perspective, your passion is going to go way up. But you need Christ. I beg you to trust Christ. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I want to thank those watching by television. And you've seen uh, many things happen here. And uh, if you're looking for a good church, why don't you come to Morningstar? But if you're looking for a church that's neutral on these issues, don't come to Morningstar. Morningstar Baptist Church is we have unfurled our banners. We've got our marching orders. And we know who the enemy is. It's the devil. And we're, out to re we're on a rescue mission to rescue people like you. People that need Christ, need a personal relationship with Christ. And, so, and religious sinners are some of the worst sinners in America. Because you're religious, you're proud, and you're content. And you just congratulate yourself because you don't think you're as wicked as somebody else. You need the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You need to repent and believe on him. I beg you to do it. Pray for Bob and Vivian. Pray for others that are in the fight. And by all means, get in the fight. We need you. We need you. Father, I pray that Pastor, you I really enjoyed your message, Operation Midwife, and we uh, read that out of Exodus 1. Yeah, it was, um, and it was good to have Bob and Vivian with us. Uh, what a great couple that um, have done more than just give lip service about their intense hatred of abortion, yes. but also their intense love for precious women that get trapped in this wicked satanic society that says it's okay to kill babies. I just, I don't know. It just amazes me. You know, we, I remember when I was a young teenager and a young man, I would read about the ancient civilizations that would sacrifice babies mm -hmm. to Moloch and so on. And I'm thinking, man, my goodness, man, how can these people, or were they human? And now here we are <clears throat> in America, and we're doing the same thing. Of course, that one, that one demoniac woman down in Florida actually confessed. She runs, she actually owns three or four abortion clinics, and she admitted that she is a witch, she's a Wicca, and that she sacrifices babies to Satan. And she admits that. And so we've, we've got a, a wicked society. But you know, here's the worst part. Many of you are watching by television, you don't care. It doesn't bother you. You hear about this, and you think, oh, yeah, that's awful. All right, now, you know, where's the popcorn? And that, that's just, that's your attitude. I, I don't get it. I, I don't know. I don't, is there any hope for America? There isn't if we don't repent. If God doesn't give us repentance, we are, we are done in this country. You cannot kill probably close to 2 million babies a, a year and think God is going to just wink at that and just, you know, say, oh, well, people will be people. Nope. God will judge America very severely. N not just because of what we are doing about killing babies, but because we have forgotten God and where we came from. America used to be a righteous nation. Not anymore. So you live in America, right? And uh, you pray for this country, and if you're going to a church that does not take a flat-footed stand against these type of things, then get out of that church. Will you stop giving your money to those rotten churches? Uh, stop doing it. Uh, why? Why? Well, my mom went there. Who cares? Just get out of that church and support a church that's going to take a righteous stand. Come see us this uh, November. We are in, involved in Mission Month where we try to get money to send to missions. So pray about that and then come see our church sometime. We'd love to have you. We'd be honored if you'd visit our church and bring your family. God bless you. I'll see you next Sunday. Thank you, Pastor, for that. And we are so glad that you've tuned in today. Pastor uh, didn't say this week that uh, our times are 9.30, 10.30, and 6 on Sunday mornings. So I'm telling you that. Also, our service on Wednesday nights starts at 7.30. We're so glad that you've tuned in today. Uh, we would also like for you to take a look at your internet at your convenience. Uh, we have a website called MorningstarNetwork.org. Under that, you'll find msbc.com and sermonaudio.com slash, it's not over, AntiochBaptistCollege.net, Delta Force, and other church ministries. Also, we would love to, to remind you that we have a cantata, December 12th and 13th, and uh, it's the King of Love. And uh, we are presently working on that. And uh, I'm excited about it. I know that you would be too if you'll come and see. We'd love for you to come and join us. And uh, that's at 7000 Summerhill Drive. That's in Little Bergen, Westchester, just off Tylersville, between Cincinnati Dayton Road and I-75. 
take Second Street to Shirley, Shirley to Lawrence, Lawrence changes into Summerhill, Summerhill changes into our driveway. We're so glad that you've tuned in today. We hope to see you soon. And until then, uh, goodbye. <music>